thanks for watching us today. We drive a 1971 Austin 3 litre. Yeah. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, please consider hitting that like button, hitting that um, subscribe button and sharing it if you enjoy. Thanks guys. Now on with the film. Going back many years, Austin always used to have a big car on their fleet, something for the executives, the directors of companies to you know, put their hard-earned money into. And come the end of the 1950s into the 1960s, the Westminster was tiring and so they needed something new. In a tale you've probably heard before, which involves penny pinching, no money, shortages of every kind, Austin under British Motor Holdings, or BMH, had no money and were penny pinching and were short of money. And so, they started work on the ADO 61. However, they were still determined to have a big executive car on the fleet. And in 1963, they prototyped this, but it didn't make it to the market until 1967, broadly unchanged. Known internally as the ADO 61, harshly nicknamed as the Land Lobster, you probably know it as the Austin 3 litre. Okay, first of all, let's talk about the elephant in the room, the doors. And in fact, the entire center section is basically an Austin 1800 or Land Crab, hence the Land Lobster, unkind nickname. You see, they didn't have any money to develop an entirely new chassis and base section, so they started off with the forthcoming ADO 17. This actually was released before the ADO 17, and beyond this centre section, doesn't really bear any similarities mechanically at all, apart from hydroelastic, but again, even that's different. So, this was both a help in terms of pressings being cheaper, because they had lots of them, but a hindrance because it reminded everyone of its humble beginnings. If you're putting an executive car in the market, you don't want anything humble about it. So it was a curse and a blessing. And so with this centre section, although an absolutely enormous back seat area, which, wow, we're going to take a sit in there in a minute, and that's um, impressive to say the least, tacked on the back of it, we have this much bigger boot section, which actually works really well. It kind of looks like it's in very nice proportion with the body. These little, little winglet fins are really quite attractive. Delicately curving around the rear, they look quite nice. Where things aren't quite so cohesive in terms of design is this bonnet. It is extremely long in an executive car manner, but it's ever so slightly out of proportion with the back end of the car. It does house that rather lovely Austin 3 litre. Just look at this front end. It's like something out of Thunderbirds. It's just so imposing and 1960s and well, grand, really. In terms of 1960s executive car design, this really is as good as it gets. Early designs of the car actually trialled some oblong rectangular headlights, which were criticised as looking like tiny TV sets. Um, and the photos don't really make it look particularly impressive. The twin headlights are far more handsome. But the looks of the car were a big sticking point. Some people loved them, unfortunately quite a lot of people didn't. So the car wasn't a massive success as had been hoped. Early on in the design phases of this car, it was decided they were gonna use the MGC's six cylinder engine. It had been around in a few other cars previously, but for this car, because it was going the ultimate luxury car that they could imagine, they upgraded it from a four um, crank bearing to a seven crank bearing to make it even smoother. I don't know. This really is a nice engine. It's astonishingly smooth, but it's got that lovely, crisp um, six-cylinder snarl to it as well. So it gives good, you know, luxury car power delivery. Not rapid like a sports car, but punchy with, you know, good torque to it. Now, this interior is very nice. This is where the difference between your regular blue collar working man's Austin and the director's Austin really steps up. Look at these big, big armchairs with their individual pull down armrests. You are just lounging more comfortable than you're in your gentleman's club by the fireside. This is just beautiful. Admittedly, because this is an Austin and not something like a Vandenpla or a Woolsley, um, you don't have leather. You do just have this very nice vinyl, which is like, yeah, it's a nice vinyl, but it's not leather. However, the dashboard itself is just this big, 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 beautiful slab of wood veneer, which carries on onto the door caps as well. A little cracked in places, or the veneer's lifting in a few places because it is, you know, best part of 60 years old now. But the styling, it's a real interesting mismatch of, well, the center section with these square dials is almost art deco. 
looking at it, I would say the styling is more 50s than 60s on the inside. Whereas Izagonis' cars were forward looking and as futuristic as he could possibly force through the board, this is aimed more at the more conservative old money market where they didn't want change, they wanted things the same as they were before. And apparently Izagonis said more than once he wanted nothing to do with this project. It was designed entirely by other people, he had no hand in it whatsoever. Unusual for an Austin product then. So yeah, the uh, design is slightly backward looking in that respect. The, the maybe 1930s, 40s-ish centre section, maybe 50s-ish kind of style. Interestingly, they've gone with the strip speedo again. It's a very common theme of uh, Austin products at the time, same as the ADO 16 cars had. But in terms of modernity, you do have these twin eyeball vents either side of the dashboard giving good ventilation. You've got space for a radio. This car has actually been updated with a modern um, single din, I think it's a Sony actually, a head unit. And you've got actual storage. You've got a proper glove box for one thing, although this appears to have like a vault key on it, like a safe. But you've also got little item trays below that on both sides. And you've got elasticated door pockets in both doors. Plus you have this little tray in front of the gear shift, which is the ideal size for a mobile phone. They were really thinking very far ahead with this car. The way the wood has been cut and shaped is very traditional. You have these deep recesses for all of the dials and the uh, switch panels. And the angular nature of it makes it look like something from about two decades previous to when the car was actually built. But having said all that, it does hang together as a single piece of design. It works well with itself. Now, unlike American cars of the time, which would have had electric windows, this still has the, uh, the manual variety, front and rear. But you do have little nice natty quarter lights with a, actually with a push button lock, because quarter lights could be quite an easy to overcome security risk without any kind of locking mechanism. And these path in door handles. Now let's take a look in the back. Now, if you were a company director, or some kind of executive or board member, this is where you would spend most of your time and there is plenty of room for you and your paperwork and possibly your secretary as well or stenographer taking notes on a stenographic machine of some kind. Stenograph? You have a nicely sized elasticated pocket on the back of each seat, good for gubbins and bits and bobs and important documents for your company. You have these walnut or ash, I don't know, there's this wood veneered ashtray on both of the rear seats. Same door handle and same door handle and uh, winder as in the front. And of course you have a large, secure handle for grabbing onto and a nice coat hook, a nice sort of button style coat hook. You also have an, an opening quarter light, which looks like it doesn't open, but in fact it does. So you have eight opening windows in this car, which is uh, an extravagance no less. Separating you from your equally important business partners, a large armrest here in the rear. This car was built around the time that seatbelts started becoming a thing to do. The P6 had them as standard. It was the first car to have rear seatbelt fixings as standard, if not the actual belts themselves, just somewhere to bolt them to. That was launched in 1963. This car doesn't appear to have anything beyond a speaker grill in the rear shelf. You do have inertia reel belts in the front, which look to me like they're original, judging by the webbing, and the fact they're really hard to use. But the thing we need to focus on here in the back is the legroom. It's just immense. You can really, really stretch out here. I have got more room than I know what to do with. Ah, you could put a family of four in the back here. This is just vast, absolutely enormous. The wood cappings are beautiful here in the back. This is the place to be in this car. Let your man do the driving and luxuriate in the back. Also worth a quick mention is this boot. Certainly it's big enough for a couple of sets of golf clubs if you and your other fellow board members are off for a quick round for lunch or whatever it is you do when you play golf. It's very, very long, it's very, very wide, but not deep at all. I mean, this is literally all you can see is all you get. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an unusual shape, but it's quite cavernous. You can get, if you, if you were going camping in this car, you would certainly get a big tent and all your luggage in, no problem at all. That would be fine. You do have the, uh, the hanging base of the little loudspeaker in the seat on the rear shelf just there, and a courtesy light, because, because luxury. I'm just gonna say thanks to Sussex Classics and Crawley Down for the loan of this car for this uh, road test today. The link is in the description below. Check those guys out. They are very nice people who I'm very grateful to. Thank you, Sussex Classics. Now that three litre straight six does have rather a nice little rumble to it, doesn't it? Beautiful, crisp, aggressive. 
it means business. This is a car for business people who are going to do business. Let's find reverse. I don't drive automatics very much. This car prototyped in 1963. It didn't go into production until 1967. And even then, that was only in very limited numbers. And because Leyland had taken over British Motor Holdings by that point, they didn't have much faith in the car as a product or the style or anything else. And so the first couple of hundred cars were only given to very, very trusted, loyal customers, company executives, journalists they thought would give favourable reviews. So the car wasn't actually on general release until 1968. And although they gave thought to uh, changing it up as a Vandenpla and a Wolseley version of it, they never followed through. And there were even thoughts of sticking the Rover V8 in as well. That light aluminium engine with more power than this, it's another 20 horsepower, even in basic tune, would have been uh, quite an exciting proposition. It never happened, and after just, well, three years in full production, they cancelled this in 1971. And that's a shame, because it was never really given the chance to flourish. And the thing you really, really notice when you drive this car, the first time you climb into it and set off down the road, is, wow, just how smooth can you make a car? Honestly, not much smoother than this. The one carryover from Isagonis' designs was a hydroelastic suspension. They did change things up a little bit. They moved some of the positions of the rubber spring mountings. They changed the position of some of the hoses so you get almost no bounce back and a far smoother ride. I and mean, the weight of the car helps with that smooth ride as well. But everything else, to cater for a you know, traditional, somewhat staid market of uh, executive, of you know, the, the older board member generation with big money to spend, Everything else was kept very, very traditional. It's a longitudinal engine. It's a gearbox behind the engine and it's rear wheel drive. None of this front wheel drive transverse mounted nonsense for you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, unlike one of Isagonis' projects where he was the man in charge with a singular vision to make the car exactly his own, this car came from George Harriman at an executive level and then the concept was thrashed out by the board members of BMH and they even got Rolls Royce involved and you can kind of tell that by the way that the wood looks and the way the car rides. It even has self-leveling suspension rams in the rear suspension. So as the weight goes up in the back because people are climbing into the rear seat, the suspension rams will lift the rear of the car to keep it nice and flat. It's a hydraulic system which will work even with the engine turned off as long as there's pressure in the system. Now as standard the car came with a four-speed manual gearbox but more popular would be the, uh, the three-speed Borg Warner 35, which this car has. A very popular gearbox at the time, fitted an awful lot of British and American cars. And it's a smooth, shifting three-speeder. It's a basic old-fashioned gearbox that does the job. It's not the swiftest of shifting things, but it does the job and it does it very smoothly indeed. And if you're after a, a silky smooth change to go with your silky smooth ride, then this is the feather bed option for you. That engine up front is very nice. It's not really rapid. In the way that a P6 V8, for example, feels like a fast car, this kind of doesn't. This feels like a heavier thing with more, more weight and, I don't know, more gravitas, perhaps. Sadly, compared even to the V8, it is kind of thirsty. In automatic form, it gets about 16 miles to the gallon, which is, not a lot in anyone's book but it is deliciously smooth and makes a lovely crisp noise if you can wear that mpg then yeah it's not a bad thing everything about this car is done for ease of use making it the comfortable gentle pleasant ride for a man of means the steering is ridiculously light and even though this car is 60 years old there is like no play in this whatsoever it still feels just as tight as new but the you can just drive with one little pinky in fact I can do the little pinky it passes the little pinky test no problem there of course when you're driving with one little pinky you can't use the right hand blinky flasher indicator when you stamp on that left hand pedal this car will just stop 
on a die. Stop on a die? You turn on a die. What do you stop on? A sixpence? You turn on sixpences as well. I'm, I'm confused. It stops on something very short indeed. It stops easily and rapidly with no, no hassle. I don't know. I didn't make these things up. If you know what stuff stops on, let me know in the comments, because I'm confused now. Now the thing I don't like much about driving automatic is when you hit a hill and you want to change down, if you want to do that you actually have to push the pedal really hard in order to make it shift and kick down, but then you're going faster than you actually wanted to go in the first place, so you... Uh, it's all just a little bit annoying. Now unfortunately, this wasn't the strong seller that uh, they'd hoped for, and they only sold 9,992 of these over the three, well, three and a bit years it was on sale, which makes it a very rare car to find today. Which is a shame, it is a beautiful thing. They've managed to combine some really clever forward-thinking technology in a slightly old-fashioned package to appease the buying public who would be uh, spending money on a car of this nature. And although the looks were, well, not easily accepted at the time, it's really grown into them over the years. I actually think it looks quite cool, quite dignified. It's got a real 1960s swagger about it, which is that kind of clean-lined, effortless look that really kind of works in today's overly styled uh, product place. I like it a lot. But in fact, it was so ill thought of internally at the time it was launched that Leyland almost launched it out of spite just because they wanted to show how far off the rails BMH had gone with their previous management not really knowing what they were doing. And it's a shame, they could have made more of it. It's a lovely car to start with. But unfortunately, by that time, although the Austin Westminster had always been a good, steady seller, Austin had been badge engineered to the wrong end of the market to be selling a big luxury car. Really, it needed to be uh, a Wolsey, Wolseley, a Riley, a Vandenpla, something like that, and not an Austin. Oh my word. I don't know if this is going to show up in any of the uh, B-roll, but there's a steam train, steam traction engine. I'm going to have to go back and get a second video of that. <laughs> That's so cool. What a lovely thing. Oh, it smells beautiful. That smell of kind of, I don't know, it's wood, sto wood smoke and steam you get from those old things. It's just like nothing else. Anyway, where was I? I've completely lost my train of thought because of that thing. Ah, oh, dear me. Yeah, so they didn't sell many of them. So it's a rare thing today, but it's such a well-made car. So although it shares that center section with the Land Crab, the 1800 and 2200, it's actually 50 centimetres longer overall. The, um, the Land Crab is 4.2 metres long. This is 4.7. That's a really big car. And most of it is in the nose. The rear of it looks really in proportion, but the, the front end just looks just, I don't know, 10 centimetres too long. Just slightly gawky, but I don't know. I'm going to forgive it because you get a lovely great straight six underneath there, which kind of makes up for everything, really. Oh, it's not the rapidest of things. Despite being three litres and straight six, you really do feel that 0 to 60 of around 15 seconds. But honestly, I just cannot get over that velvet smooth ride. It's just a thing of absolute beauty. I could cruise in this car literally all day. It is just such a nice thing to be in. Turn the radio on, put some tunes. Happy place to be. I like this car an awful lot. Of course, being a 60s British car, we've got our flashing Austin green light on the end of the thing. I know how much you all like that. And something I didn't mention, I've completely forgot to say, this car has absolutely no T-shelf whatsoever. What kind of executive motor has zero T-shelf going on whatsoever? You've got nothing on this, obviously padded for safety, I suppose. It's pretty hard immediately under the padding. 
this um, glove box, I can't open, I haven't got the key for it on me. Um, and there's not tables in the back of the chairs. Where does your teacup go? Where is the tea shelf? How, honestly, what were they thinking? I've just, with that thought, that one thought, this car's gone from like an eight or a nine out of 10 to a, a paltry four, oh, honestly. How can you get it so wrong? I don't know. If you enjoyed this slightly esoteric trip into Austin's history, a maybe forgotten item of uh, the land barge or the land, the land lobster. Not the la everyone remembers the land crab. Do many people remember the land lobster? Not many, I don't think. Hopefully, I've done something to raise its profile today. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've if you have, smash the like button, smash the subscribe button, share with your friends on sticker on Facebook and all those wonderful Facebooky, internetty, social mediary things that people are supposed to do apparently. And thank you for tuning in and I'll see you again next time.